Um, welcome back to the um, to the middle session of today's IGS meeting. Um, I'm really pleased to have Bill Quo, who is I'm going to give today's uh, uh, keynote talk. Um, a little bit about Bill is Bill is one of the few people in the world who has incredibly deep knowledge, both in the world of numerical weather prediction and data simulation, but also in uh, GNSS applications for atmospheric science. Uh, so it's this is sort of a nice uh, chance for Bill to reach back to the GNSS geodesy community and show how that data, how GNSS data is being used um, for atmospheric applications. Um, so Bill Quo is the director of the UCAR community programs. Um, he, in previous versions of his life, he has uh, been a, a scientist and a senior scientist at, at, at NCAR. Um, he's also served as the director of the Developmental Testbed Center, um, which is a joint center that eventually, I think, would be called, uh, sort of moved into a joint testbed component. Um, and in that capacity, he worked with both the operational NWP community to sort of transition, facilitate transition from research to operations. Um, he also has a, a deep history within um, GPS uh, remote sensing and GP and particularly radio occultation technology. Uh, Bill Quo is also the uh, director of the Cosmic Program, where I work and Jan Weiss works. Um, from he was the director from 1997 through 2015, and he was uh, a key leader in two missions that advanced radio occultation technology: Cosmic One, which was a joint U.S. Taiwan satellite mission called Formosat-3 in Taiwan, and then also the Cosmic-2 mission, um, which was launched about three years ago, three years, June of 2019. So we just passed its uh, three-year anniversary on the 25th of June. Um, Bill's going to give a, a summary here about how GNSS technology um, uses uh, IGS data and sort of it rests on the foundation of GNSS um, infrastructure to impact numerical weather prediction, climate, and atmospheric science. Um, Bill, do you want to go ahead and get started? Bill, you're on mute. Can you, can you, now we can hear. Oh, now, now we can. Go ahead. I think you're muted again, Bill. Sorry. Muted. Okay. Now, can you hear me now? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's the problem of a data pointer. Well, thank you uh, for inviting me to give this presentation. It's a great honor uh, to be speaking to this uh, very uh, distinguished group. And I wanted to uh, get the get go to acknowledge that the radio occultation really rely heavily on the product and services from IGS. So we are very, very grateful for all the product and services, which really making uh, radio occultation possible. And I'm gonna to try to show you here today on how radio occultation is important uh, for weather prediction. And again, showing how the product and services from IGS has been essential for us to be able to, to make this happen. And thanks to John for, for the, intro, the nice introduction. So I'm going to start, and I wanted to say that uh, the work presented today really uh, consists of uh, the, the group effort of the entire Cosmic team, not just myself, including uh, Zhang, uh, Brown, and Yang Wise, and many of our uh, scientists and engineers. Can you uh, see? Uh, it's not the prevention. Is it a prevention? No. We see the, um, there we go, Bill. Okay, great. So uh, I would like to kind of give a first introduction to UCA. I'm not sure everybody know what UCA is. The is the home organization for Zhang and me, and we will have a brief introduction on the uh, the on the. Um, see, I could just I could just uh, get out the. Okay, sorry. I was trying to see if I can get out of the laser point. <laughs> so anyway, so we will introduce the UCA and then we will uh, introduce the radio quotation technique and we'll talk about 
the satellite missions uh, for radio quotation and then try to show you some of the applications, one onto the prediction of tropical cyclones, particularly how the cyclone form is called the tropical cyclone genesis, and also how the radio quotation technique is important uh, to improve heavy rainfall prediction associated with uh, significant convections. So first, a few slides on Yuka. Yuka was established uh, back in 1960s. Initially, we only had 14 members. It was created by 14 member North American universities that has a PhD program. And they feel they need to have major uh, facility to support their research. So they approach NSF to say, hey, can we have a national center uh, so that we can have the uh, research aircraft, Doppler radars, you know, supercomputers to support our research. So they get together and wrote a proposal to the NSF and NSF agreed to support this national center. Then NSF say, well, we don't manage uh, any major facility. You have to find somebody to manage it. So these 14 universities decided to get together and establish this uh, university co corporation, which is a nonprofit corporation, to help manage the national center, which is NCA. And over the past 60 years, we our membership have grown from 14 to 123. When we got started, we had less than 300 people. Today, we have about 1,400. And of course, uh, our major mission here is to support the community with the national center that provide uh, the, all those major, major facilities. But we also, over the past 40 years, UCA also established a, a, a collection of programs that are providing support to the broad Earth system science community, which is under the, the entity called uh, UCA Community Program, UCP. And so we serve as a hub for community discussion and actions. We also provide advocacy leadership uh, for, for government to advocate for uh, Earth system science community. So with NCA, uh, of course, uh, we do a number of things that including collaborative, the collaborative research with the universities. We uh, provide world-class computer models from weather, chemistry to climate models, you know, space weather uh, prediction models. And we offer uh, Wyoming Supercomputer uh, Center that uh, provide computing resources to support university research. We also provide research aircraft, top radar to support field campaigns. And we also have great uh, education and outreach uh, to support the Earth system science community. Collectively, we do research on weather, water, space weather, climate, and air quality which is our all key component of the Earth system. And why this is important is because as we develop the radio occultation technique, uh, it's really nice to be having an anchor sitting next to us with all this scientific expertise on weather, climate, and space weather. And John can tell you how beneficial it is to have, uh, for example, a laboratory called High Altitude Observatory where well, they have scientists who are working on space weather scintillations. And, and so this has been very, very beneficial. In terms of the UCA community program, we have a total of seven programs. They are grouped into three centers. And the first one is called Earth Observation and Data Service Center. And the Cosmic program is one of the program within this center. And the other, Two program, it's uh, very important. For example, we have the so-called Joint Center for Satellite Data Simulation. They are de developing the uh, data simulation, the event data simulation system that is capable of doing the full uh, Earth system assimilation, meaning that you would assimilate not only the atmospheric observation, but also the ocean, sea ice, chemistry, all the different components of Earth system that the data can be assimilated by this, uh, the new system they're developing called JEDI. It's called Joint uh, Data Simulation Integration uh, System. And we also have the Unidata program, which provide data services. And in the past, they actually also helped us uh, provide the ground-based and, and space-based uh, GPS data distributions. And we also have education program. For example, uh, we have been, uh, providing support for forecaster training through the CARMAP program. 
And the educational material being developed has been very, very popular by the university community. We also have a Center for uh, Science Education. You can go to the Enka Mesa Lab and you see all these exhibits you know, talking about climate change. They are all part of it. And we also have a GROW program. I'm sure many of you already heard about that. It's an international um, K-12 education program. And we also have a program called uh, CPAS, and that is providing, like for example, climate and global change postdoctoral fellowship. We are, we are supporting major events such as ocean observation, which was participated by more than 2,000 people. So anyway, we have a, a collection of very nice program. They are geared towards supporting the community. And today's work is mainly focused on the work being done by the COSMIC program. Thank you. And so now I wanted to start talking about radio quotation. The first, uh, first, uh, this, first of all, I wanted to say that the radio quotation, the original technique was actually developed in the late 1960s. And the whole idea here is that we want to measure the atmosphere of the Mars. And how do you, how do you take measurement on that? You certainly cannot send a research aircraft over there. So the idea here is that if you put a satellite and transmit radio wave from behind the Mars, and then you try to receive that signal from the Earth at, at, on Earth, then by seeing how the ray has been bended, you can deduce information on the Martian's atmosphere. And so this was uh, the initial uh, concept was actually came out of that marina mission. And the question here is that uh, uh, if it works for Mars, why don't we apply it over Earth? Well, you, you immediately meet, uh, meet uh, two challenges. One, in a compared to Mars, Earth is very well sampled. And we already have microwave, infrared, radio sound, many type of observations. Well, number one, is, it, is this radio quotation good enough to be useful for weather and climate? And secondly, you also need to have a constant radio source so that you can uh, do that radio quotation. And of course, luckily, uh, we have uh, the GPS system that was uh, created by the Department of Defense in the late 1970s, so that provided the sources. So the question though is uh, how good it is and whether it really matters to weather and climate. And so that's really, the heart of the issue. So before I go into the uh, other missions, I want to just kind of a quick um, demonstration and explanation about how uh, how this uh, work. Um, I could, uh, uh, that's the problem. I'm still having trouble. Of, uh, okay. Now, okay, now I can do it. Okay, great. So. Uh, we all know, I don't need to explain to you what GPS is. I mean, everybody knows about that. And also, of course, we all know that the GPS constantly uh, broadcasting radio wave, they are located about 20,000 kilometers above the Earth. So if you put a small satellite that are circulating around the, uh, low Earth orbiting, as they circle around the Earth and uh, uh, behind the Earth, and you can take measurement of the signal, from the GPS measuring the phase and amplitude. And from that, because uh, the radio wave would go straight night in the vacuum, but as the Earth's atmosphere, as they enter the Earth's atmosphere because of the vertical uh, density change, uh, they will be bended, it will be slowed and bended. And so you can measure the amplitude and the frequency of the radio wave as, as our satellite is setting or rising behind the Earth. And by taking these measurements uh, as, they, as they go crude, and you can actually get a vertical uh, profile of uh, bending angle as the ray is bending at the ray parity point. And from that, uh, from that vertical profile of bending angle, you can deduce a vertical profile of refractivity, which is basically a vertical profile of density. And also the radio wave, of course, would be affected by the electron density. So you could also deduce the vertical profile of electron density, and those would be very valuable for space weather. And you say, well, wh why would this work? And, and essentially, as you can see here, we are looking at the Earth's atmosphere. And of course, it's very uh, dense near the surface and it becomes lighter. So you have a very significant 
vertical density gradients. And as the ray is penetrating, going through the Earth's atmosphere, because of the vertical density gradient, the ray will be bended. And it's really no different from like we put a chopsticks into the water, in a glass of water, and you see that's being reflected. And the only difference is here is that uh, the Earth's atmosphere density variation is much more gradual. And so you can see the continuous bending rather than a, a distinct discontinuity. And so this is uh, the kind of the basic concept. And of course, uh, we talked about uh, the important to have the radio quotation, but the question is how good it is, whether it will be useful for the atmosphere uh, of, of the Earth. And so um, we are very proud to say that uh, UCAR in 1995 uh, supported a mission called GPS Meteorology. And this was the first mission to, to as a proper concept to see how good it is. So as again, explain about this again is basically, we launched small satellite and we would track this, the phase and amplitude of the radio waves as our satellite is setting or rising behind the earth. And you could see if our satellite is located here, I don't know if you can see it now, but if, can you see my cursor? Yes, I can okay. see it. Okay, great. So if you can see the cursor here, you can see if, uh, if we, uh, on the lower point, it, the ray should have been blocked by the earth. But the reason you can still see it is because the ray has been bended. And so you could see that if you draw a tangent line here, this satellite actually is falling behind or below the tangent line. And it is very important to be able to track to be as low as possible. And of course, there'll be challenges because um, as you go down to the lower, very close to the surface, the ray, the radio wave will be scattered by, by the atmosphere and, and you really have to have a strong antenna and strong receiver so that you can kept, uh, catch the signal. Uh, but anyway, in show here, as a repeat, uh, by doing the radio quotation, we can get a vertical profile of electron density. We can also get the vertical profile of refractivity. And from that, you can deduce information on water vapor and temperature. And now I wanted to kind of uh, go back to this slide. You know, as like I said, if you draw a tangent line and your satellite can be tracking below that tangent line. And now this, uh, let's look at uh, this diagram. This is a diagram uh, provided by Sergei Sokolovsky at, at, in Cosmic. And you can see uh, on the red is showing you the, 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 the amplitude of the signal. And the black line is showing the excess Doppler uh, uh, phase, uh, the frequencies. And you notice that uh, when you are high above uh, the tangent surface, like 100 kilometers above the tangent surface, and you can see that we have very strong signal, of course, because you don't, you don't really too much impeded by the atmosphere. On the other hand, because you are so high, there isn't that much bending. So you have a very small phase change. So that's also kind of, you don't really have too much signal in there. And when you get down to the lower part, let's say you are 200 kilometers below the tangent point, you got huge bending uh, from the uh, phase shift. But on the other hand, your amplitude is very, very small. So this is actually the challenging part, the lower troposphere, because uh, the signal has been reduced to, to cross the noise level in terms of amplitude. And therefore, you really need to have high gain antenna uh, and accurate uh, model added open door tracking so that you can uh, deduce uh, useful information out of that. And if you look at uh, between zero to minus 50, you got good amplitude. You also got good bending, you know, good uh, Doppler shift. So this is called the sweet spot. This is the best place because, and that tend to be located in the uh, upper troposphere and lower stratosphere. And so that tend to be the sweet spot. And um, today my talk is gonna be focused on the lower troposphere, how challenging it is and how important it is. And that's where, in my opinion, where the, um, the cutting edge is. So again, uh, how we process the data, you get the amplitude and, and, and the phase, the frequency, the satellite frequency, 
from the GPS. And of course, you got uh, L1 and L2. And then you can calculate the vertical profile of bending angle. And you try to eliminate the impact of, um, uh, 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 of the ionosphere. And then from that, you can then calculate the refractivities. And from that, you can go through, we call it one dimensional variational um, uh, retrieval to get information on temperature, pressure, and water vapor. And I just wanted to say that if you go through our processing, you actually need a lot of the product and services uh, from the IGS. For example, we need uh, your, uh, the, we, we need to your your crack product, uh, your uh, Leo orbit information, the GPS orbit information. All of these are critical for our uh, retrieval, and so we are most grateful uh, for the the product and the services that have been provided by the radio by the IGS community. And just wanted to let you know that uh, as we get all this information, we can then estimate uh, our deals of it and crack, and then allow us to calculate the excess phase. And from that, uh, we can do the geometric and wave optics uh, retrieval, and then can deduce uh, the most right product. Again, it's uh, my opportunity to thank you all for providing those critical observations for us. And so this uh, is the first mission we call the GPS meteorology. It's a, a, a small satellite. It's actually owned by Orbital Corporation, and it was launched um, using uh, Pegasus, which is uh, actually a rocket hanging right underneath the belly of the aircraft, and it took off uh, mid-air. And this is the first profile we got, and we were kind of shocked that it was so good because we happened to have a balloon sounding nearby, and it's right on the dot. And I wanted to point out to you that for this particular sounding, because in the early, early stage of radio quotation, uh, we were using something called a cross loop, and uh, the receiver is off the shelf, is not great, and also we don't have good tracking uh, algorithm, so we can really do much, get much signal uh, below like uh, seven or eight kilometers. And then you know that for meteorology, if you miss that bottom eight kilometer, you you miss everything, in my opinion. And so this is really the first proof of concept, and later on, of course. Um, we had the opportunity to cooperate with Taiwan and we were working on the Cosmic uh, One mission. And we have six satellite constellation and it was launched in April, 2006. And this is actually the world first uh, constellation of uh, satellite that are designed to demonstrate how the radio quotation data can be used to support operation. And, and so this is a lower diagram kind of showing you the green dots is uh, the, the radio quotation sounding location, the tension point. And the red dot is showing you the, the balloon sounding locations. So basically we have the balloon station, the radio sound location stations. And if you look at that is that, well, you know, most of the tropical cyclones, they form over, for example, the Atlantic. And look at how many radio sounds you have. You basically have nothing over the open ocean. Or you, when you're looking at severe convections, again, most of the time, like for example, you got South China Sea, you have no radio sound observations. And, and so these radio quotation being available in open ocean is absolutely critical for the prediction of severe weather. And we are very pleased that uh, the cosmic one was originally uh, designed to have, we call it the mission life of two years because we don't know what will happen after two years. And we have enough fuel to keep it running for five years. And we are very, very pleased to say that um, Cosmic actually operated for 14 years. And collectively, we have uh, collected a total of seven million profiles. And if you look at the average, you know, the total cost of that mission from, uh, from design to implementation to operation, it's roughly on the order of $114 million. So if you think about it, uh, our radio quotation profile is about $20 per profile. And if you ask me how much it's gonna cost for the radio song, I would say the material itself for a balloon sounding, you have to have the balloon, you have to have the helium, you have to have the instrument, at minimum, you're talking about 200 
uh, to, to, to $300. Then you also have to have people manning the station. So by the time you add it all up, it's between $500 to $1,000 of per radio song. So you could see uh, this is really a cost effective and, and uh, uh, observing system. And so, of course, we were very, very pleased that this is a picture taken uh, during the for the uh, first Cosmic One mission. I can tell you I was a lot younger then. Here's uh, uh, our uh, UCA president then, uh, Rick Antis. And uh, so with the success of Cosmic One, we start planning for a Cosmic Two mission. And, and it's a focus on the tropical uh, latitudes. Uh, it's a 24 degree inclination. We have six satellites. And we are using the advanced um, receiver called uh, TGIS. Uh, and then we also have uh, a, an advanced uh, antenna technology. We are using uh, uh, electronically steerable antenna. And those actually are quite critical because this allow us to track much lower uh, into the uh, lower trop tropical troposphere, which is really, really critical. I'll show you later. And also because uh, you can be electronically steered toward the source, you have a much higher signal noise ratio on average. We are, we are between 2 to 2.5 times better than the cosmic one in terms of our signal strength. And this actually shows that it's really critical for severe weather prediction. And uh, so this is the satellite we have, and we have the TGIS uh, antenna, like I said, this is the face array radar that uh, the antenna, so uh, it, it allow you to electronically steer toward the source. We have an IF beacon antenna. We have uh, POD antenna for, uh, on the top. We also have ion velocity meters. And so this is a spacecraft. And it was, uh, it was based on the design for the SSTL uh, in UK. And uh, it, the, 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 the spacecraft was uh, developed by Taiwan's NSPO. So again, we were very happy for the launch. It was done uh, in almost three years ago. So I wanted to take a pause here to show you that uh, why do we care about Cosmic 2, why it is important. And uh, so this is a statistic uh, coming out of the our Cosmic team, Janet Chen, and on the top, uh, panel, we are showing the statistics that we collected. We try to collocate uh, the cosmic two profile versus the other RO uh, missions profile. And you can see on the upper uh, panel, most of the dots are in the, the light to, uh, to deep uh, blue. And it's really, if you look at the color scale on the bottom here, zero is very blue and one, they can continue becoming turning into red. And it basically, what does this show? is showing you the termination point, the lowest point of your radio occultation profile. And you can see most of our dots are uh, very low. So it, uh, it actually shows that on the average of, uh, of like 10,000 pairs, the mean of the termination point of cosmic two we go down to 0.65 kilometers. So those are very, very close to the surface. And you have to realize this is purely over the traffic, which is very challenging. And if you look at all the other missions, the mean, you can see a lot of yellow, a lot of red, and this is on average, we are looking at 1.8 kilometers. So why do you care about this? Because uh, I will show you, it's actually important because uh, I don't know, I'm a meteorologist and we know very well, 70% of the water vapor is residing within the bottom three kilometers. So if you are terminating at 1.8, you're, miss, you're missing 60% of the water vapor. And water vapor is the driver for weather and climate. And so you're missing a big part on the weather prediction. And so that's really critical. So I wanted to show you, um, how the radio quotation is important for, uh, say, tropical cyclone formation prediction. And, uh, you know, of course, we nowadays, uh, we don't predict, we don't do tropical cyclone prediction subjectively. We all rely on heavily on, on weather models, particularly the global models. 
And I've been interacting with the hurricane community and the and the um, uh, risk mitigation communities. You know, like uh, how they were they were of course always concerned about when a hurricane hit. Uh, how much time do you have for evacuation? And and you ask FEMA, they will tell you that I wanted as much time as possible. Can you give me a seven day forecast that uh, when the typhoon is going to or hurricane is going to hit us? And of course, that's that's uh, challenging because seven day, well, even five day, sometimes even three days, you don't see a hurricane even on your weather map. So how do you do a good job? And that's really coming down to the tropical cyclone uh, formation prediction. We in meteorology we call tropical cyclone genesis forecast. And so it'll be interesting for us to look at how the different global models, you know, the world well-known, renowned uh, global centers, how well they do in terms of tropical cyclone forecast. And so this is a diagram that's showing the, uh, the evaluation of models forecast skills. They are looking at how well the model is doing based on the data they collected from 2004 to 2014, so 11 year of statistics. And the, um, the y-axis here is called the probability uh, of detection. And basically one meaning that if you have 10 tropical cyclones, uh, you can predict 10 of them. If you have 10 hurricanes, you catch your 10 of them. So it will be perfect. And this is uh, on the x-axis here is called a success ratio. Is if, if you have one, it basically saying if model predict 10 uh, hurricanes, you actually in reality, there are 10 hurricanes. And so one minus the success ratio is called the false unknown. So now if you look at the three or four of this uh, very well-known global uh, prediction center, this is Canadian Meteorological Center called CMC. And the probability of detection is about 0.3. That means that they can predict three out of the 10 storms. But this guy is doing very poorly. It's like a success ratio is 0.35. It means that this, for this model, if you predict 10 storms by the model, 6.5 of them are fake, didn't never happen. And this so-called GFS is our own US model. And again, it's 0.2. So which means that if there are 10 real storm, we can only capture two. And the success ratio is 0.45. It means that the model predict 10, 5.5 of them are fake, didn't happen. And then the other two also very well known uh, was the center UK meteorological office, European Center for Medium Range Forecast. They are all roughly at 0.2. So which means that they don't really differentiate themselves that much in terms of probability detection. They have problems. Basically, out of 10 real storms, they can only predict two. But the difference here is the success ratio here. The open center is about 0.7. So that means that if they predict 10, only three are fake. So if you compare all the different global models, we are, we are behind these two guys. And, uh, and in particular in the area of false alarm, we just have too many false alarms. So, well, you could say, look, Bill, this is, this is 2014, that's ancient, what happened now? And we don't have a lot of statistics, but the more recent one is uh, I got uh, results from NSEP. They were looking at the latest version of the GFS model uh, based on statistics from 2018 to 2020 as they prepare for the implementation. We moved to here, I think we have improvement in terms of success ratio to about 0.6. So we still uh, we still predict like four uh, thick storms out of 10. And we have small improvement in terms of probability of detection. We move from 0.2 to 0.25. And it's still, in my opinion, not good enough. And the main problem is we don't have a lot of observation. And we still have challenges in data simulation. And the model is not perfect either. So I wanted to show you how radio occultation is useful to help improve the tropical cyclone formation prediction. And so in 2008, we happened to have a storm called uh, Typhoon Nuri. This is on the Western Pacific. Interestingly, on this particular case, none of the global models predict the genesis. So we are very interested in seeing how the radio occultation from Cosmic One would be helpful in improving the prediction. So what we did was we tried to uh, assimilate the radio quotation data 
over a three day period and the genesis uh, would be taking place uh, after we end the data simulation and start to make a forecast. It should happen within two days after uh, we complete the analysis. And so I'm gonna show you uh, a movie that is uh, on the left hand side is showing the model that did not assimilate the radio quotation data from Cosmic One. On the right hand side, they are doing exactly the same except we assimilate uh, the radio quotation data. And what I'm showing you is a integrated crowd hydro media is basically a model simulated crowd fields. It's like if you're looking from the top of the earth and looking down. And I'm showing you here, uh, at the beginning, you can see that there are, uh, there are crowds popping up. They are, they are showing some rotations on both sides. And you can see that uh, the one with uh, radio quotation assimilation, they seem to be clustering together, even though there's still some cross clustering. But this one seems to be stronger and they are lining up uh, each other into a, a convective line. And later on, you can see the line is wrapping around each other. And they will, lo and behold, here we cook up a tropical cyclone. On the other hand, on the left hand side, you don't, they don't quite get together. And, and in the end, we did not simulate the genesis of tropical cyclone. And you say, well, Bill, that's, that's magic. What happened? How did the radio quotation really make a difference in that? So what we did here is we say, okay, why don't we try to sit on top of the storm and follow in the storm and try to calculate the difference between with and without the assimilation of radio quotation data. And we find that during the three-day data assimilation, the first day, there wasn't a lot of radio quotation observation near the storm center. There's very little impact. And the contour I'm showing here, the contour is uh, basically showing the water vapor differences between with and without. And so this is talking about like 1.5 gram per kilogram. It's actually significant. You're talking about 10 to 15% of humidity. So you can see on day two, we start to have the observation near the storm center. And by assimilation, we start to add more moisture into the lower part of the troposphere. You can see the 850 hectopascal, it's about 1.5 kilometers. Seven kilometer, 700 hectopascal is about three kilometers. So you could see this many located between 1.5 to two kilometers. And you notice that it continued to increase on the moisture toward the end of the second day because you got so much moisture near the bottom and the atmosphere become unstable. And it's then you set up deep convections and the color is showing you the strong vertical motion and that actually spin up the storm. So you can see the prerequisite here is that radio quotation data by having those observations, by using those observations, we were able to recover the moisture that should have been in the lower part of the troposphere, that but it was missed by the global models. So this is actually quite critical. And so, uh, you know, you could say, hey, Bill, it's only one case. We, why do we care about this? Uh, do you have more cases? And we, we actually decided to do 35 cases and we are looking at uh, storms from 2006 to 2010 and try to simulate to study 35 cases. And before we do that, we actually go to the uh, historical uh, storm, like we had uh, like uh, about uh, 30 year, 35 year period, we have collected, look at the 531 tropical cyclones. And we find that the cyclone can be grouped essentially into two types. One is uh, this because of you have a subtropical high here and here's the easterly, and you can have cyclone that are occurring, we call it easterlies, but you could also be embedded within the monsoon, the southwest monsoon or in the monsoon confluent zone. So these are two different type of storm environments. And uh, we tend to be over the Western Pacific, we tend to have more of the monsoon type, maybe about 65% of monsoon type and 35% are more of the easterly type. And so what we did was to say, well, why don't we start the uh, certain cases uh, on the easterly type and 22, this is be proportional to the climatology. 
And when we try to look at the structure, we try to do a composite about these type of storm from the analysis, from the global analysis, and we see distinct differences because the uh, history type of tropical cyclone, they tend to be smaller, more compact, and they tend to have weaker moisture because the environment, the general environment tend to be drier. Of course, of course, near the storm center is more moist, but they, they tend to be smaller scale. The monsoon type of tropical cyclone, they are much bigger, broader, and they have the broad environment of moisture. So the environment is relatively moist. And interestingly, uh, when we try to look at how this different type, for example, we try to simulate many different cases and uh, for the easy type, it, uh, it's a 37% uh, of the population and then monsoon type is about 63%. And interestingly, you try to do uh, the, the experiment like what I did before, uh, say with or without the use of radio quotation data for each three type of storm, if we do not assimilate the radio quotation data, we have 7.7% of probability of detection. So there's, we are really challenging to predict it well. However, if we assume the radio quotation data is raised to 61.5%. So there's a huge jump. For monsoon, if you don't use radio quotation data, they actually get 54.5% because you got moisture there and you use a radio quotation, it still improved and going to 72%, it's an 18% improvement. The jump is not as big. And collectively, you do the average uh, radio quotation improve the probability of detection from 37% to about 69%. That's actually quite good. But it also telling you here is that uh, the radio quotation is particularly important for this easterly type tropical cyclone, which is smaller and very sensitive to moisture distribution. And the radio quotation is able to provide the needed observation to support that. Well, that's that's great, but um, but you, you Billy told me about the false anomaly is the main problem. So how would radio quotation be able to help that? But if you wanted to do the false alarm, you have to study those cases that didn't make it into the tropical cyclones. So we took, uh, we look at 30, uh, two cases uh, in the September, October, 2019, and we are focusing on the cosmic two radio quotation data. On the left hand side, I'm showing you your nine developing cyclones and the background is showing the, we call it the anomaly of Bautisti. So basically these tend to be forming in the Bautisti bands. And these are uh, uh, kind of these nice storm develop into uh, full fledged uh, you know hurricanes, and there, there are like twenty three storms that they they seem to have a good start but never really uh, get into the, the stage into a tropical cyclones, and so we study all these thirty two cases and try to see how uh, radio quotation data might have an impact, and just wanted to show you the contrast on the left hand side. Uh, for this our model experiment domain, and this show that uh, for one case during in a three day data simulation, uh, you, on the left hand side you show the sounding locations from Cosmic Two, and on the right hand side is all the others. So you can see Cosmic Two is contributing about eighty percent of the observation, and the other uh, is not a lot. So we try to do the simulation again, no radio quotation, with radio quotation, and observation of developing and non-developing. This is called a contingency diagram. I'm not going to go into the detail here, but many wanted to show you when you don't do the radio quotation data simulation, you are able to predict 44% of the storm. By using the radio quotation data, you raise that to 78%. And uh, the one without the radio quotation, you actually have a false alarm of 73%. By using the radio quotation data, we were able to reduce it to 53%. And it showed basically we were able to increase the probability of detection of 34% and reduce the false alarm by 20%. And like I told you before, this impact actually is bigger than almost 10 years of model improvement from our NSA global models. And so it's showing you that uh, the observation uh, over the tropical lower troposphere is really critical. 
for those kind of observations. So I now next to tell you how we can use the radio quotation data to improve heavy rainfall prediction. And um, well, first of all, I want to point out to you, I don't know if you can see my cursor here. Here's Taiwan. And here is uh, the Chinese coast. And this is a uh, infrared uh, satellite images. And the color, the red color here is showing you the cold cloud top. And this basically showing you uh, deep convections. And so you could see that there is almost a band that are cutting through southern China, going through Taiwan. And this is a almost like a, 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 a zone where you have strong convection. And actually, this is uh, happening in the in May. Uh, and usually in mid-May to mid-June, there is a, it's called the summer transition period. The Chinese call it the May U period. May stands for prom. U means rain. It's a it's a raining season during the prom growing season the, the time. So uh, interestingly, is a uh, it's a, that May U front is a. Uh, they don't have a lot of temperature contrast, but the, there's a significant moisture contrast. And convective system tend to happen uh, along that may you from as the convective system developed, uh, get off the uh, China and move into the Taiwan Strait. It doesn't take too long to cross over Taiwan Strait and hit Taiwan. And they produce a, a lot of heavy rainfall. So I'm gonna just show you here you can see that you have this convective band here. It's a, you can see the convective system develop over the ocean and then move over to Taiwan and then, uh, and then the produce heavy rainfall. Here's a, another one. And so you can see here's another one and here's another one coming in and produce heavy rainfall. So you have this uh, kind of convective band and with convective system keep on being developed over the ocean and repeatedly Hitting Taiwan, and you know that Taiwan had the central mountain range for a steep topography. So as the convective system hitting uh, the mountain, they produce very heavy rainfall. So anyway, let me show you one more time. You can see here is Taiwan, and you can see um, convective system develop over the ocean, move over, hitting the, the Taiwan's mountain range, and then produce a very heavy rainfall. Okay, so for this particular case, it took place uh, uh, in May, uh, uh, on 22nd of May. And this is showing you the one day uh, presentation, you know, actually not even one day, it's 19 hours. And it showed that the, the purple color and above the, the most white, uh, you know, that the pink color, this color area here is greater than 300 millimeters. And one particular location here is called Da Han Mountain. And we recorded 723 millimeters. And so this is really huge amount of, of appreciation. And the question here is how can radio quotation might be helpful for the prediction of such a severe uh, flooding event? And just showing you the picture uh, uh, on the city, Kaohsiung city, that got totally flooded and people were uh, walking in the rain, in the in the water. So uh, this is actually an interesting case because uh, this is kind of the early stage, you know, kind of within within an hour, uh, a year after Cosmic 2 was launched. It turned out that the European Center for Medium Range Forecast start using the data on the 25th of March. And our friend and NOAA and NSEP, they didn't start until 26th of May, 2020. And this particular case actually happened between 21 and 22nd of May of 2020. So our NSEP global models did not assimilate the COSMIC-2 data. And you say, well, why do you care about that? I'm just trying to show you here, if you look at the, uh, the water vapor, the color here is showing you the water vapor, and this is in gram per kilogram. And you can see the, the orange color is greater than 20 gram per kilogram. And the green and blue, they are more like 15 to 18 uh, kind of gram per kilogram. If you compare uh, the European Central analysis by the with the NSEP analysis, you notice here they are all exceeding 20 gram per kilogram. And these are more like uh, 16, 17 gram per kilogram. So there's a big difference between the two. 
And you notice that, uh, well, is one of the reasons is they did not use uh, the customer to data. So we also kind of wanted to um, see how the moisture is distributed. So we try to do a vertical cross section. And this showing you uh, on, the, on, the, on the contour here is showing you where convection is taking place. And we are looking at the European Center analysis. We try to do a north south cross section. And north is over here, south is over there. And we do a, a, a vertical kind of cross section. The contour here is showing you, we call it the potential temperature, kind of showing you the general kind of the menu from the, the kind of the frontal slope. And you notice that uh, to the south of convection that is feeding convection, this is where the moisture transport is taking place, but you could basically times the water vapor with a velocity and it's showing you where the maximum moisture flux is taking place. So this is one kilometer, two kilometer. You notice that most of the moisture transport is actually taking place below two kilometer and maximized at one kilometer. So think about it. If your radio quotation stop at 1.8, where would you be able to see this? You won't be able to see that. So this is actually quite important. So we try to do three experiments. One, we don't assimilate the radio quotation data. We basically use the NCEP global analysis as a starting point. And the other one is that we assimilate the uh, radio quotation data primarily from Cosmic 2, but we use something we call a simple local operator, basically treating the radio quotation as like a point measurement. And the other one we use a more sophisticated, we call the non-local because we take in, into consideration the ray geometry, and this will be a more realistic modeling of the observables. And we wanted to see how that would make an impact and we also tried to calculate the moisture transport and wanted to show you that uh, here is the three experiment. And this one, we did not use the radio quotation data. This one, we used the radio quotation data, but use a local simplified operator. And you can see this is feeding the convection right here and it's much weaker and it's not in the right location. And this one, we are using the more sophisticated non-local operator and it's really feeding uh, the, the convection. And not surprisingly, if you look at the, the precipitation forecast, this is the verification that is coming out from the radar uh, and the rain gauge, and it's showing you this within six hours, you're producing a huge amount of precipitations. And by using the radio quotation data with a more sophisticated operator, we were able to capture the distribution much more faithfully. By using the long, uh, local operator or not using it, they are not doing as well. And if you look at the precipitation scale score, we something we call the fractional scale score. It is uh, the higher the better. And you can see that uh, the GPS2, which is using the more sophisticated operator, is the rate nine. It's the highest among all, particularly on the high precipitation threshold. And the GPS one, which is uh, using a local operator, and the control, which did not use a uh, radio quotation data, not doing as well. And we also look at the BIOS score. BIOS, uh, the perfect score is one. And so you want it to be as close to one as possible. And it show again, GPS two that use the non-local operator is close to one. And the non-local operator, the local operator with the green is, is uh, better than without using it, but not as good as the more sophisticated uh, operator uh, with GPS2. Again, I hope that I'm telling you, uh, preaching the choir, that's why the Cosmic 2, you're able to track all the way to 0.65 kilometer is really critical for severe weather prediction, such as tropical cyclone and heavy rainfall prediction and the 1.8, is not really good enough uh, for uh, the water, you know, the severe weather prediction. I like to then kind of conclude, I hope I'm convincing you, the radio quotation is a, a good high impact, low cost global observation system. And we are most, most grateful to the essential service and product coming out from IGS. Without IGS, we would not be able to do radio quotation. And I'm showing you that by using these uh, Cosmic 2 radio quotation data, we are able to improve the prediction of tropical cyclones. We increase the probability of detection. We reduce the false alarm. And you can see that the global models have been struggling to improve. 
And we also show you that by using those data, we improve the precipitation forecast. And I want, I cannot uh, advocate uh, strong enough, it is really critical to detect water vapor in a lower tropical troposphere because that's where the transport is taking place. And so going forward here, I take one step back here. I would I would want to comment that uh, water vapor in its four dimensional variation is really a challenge for Miniwazu community to observe, to analyze, to predict. And so it, on the other hand, it is the most critical variable for weather and climate processes. Uh, and, and I'm showing you that the radio quotation is really providing uh, a way that can help us to address that challenge. And, and if we are gonna be continue to have greater impact, we need to continue to advance our techniques so that we can track it to the, to the surface as close as possible. And we need to continue to improve the quality and the accuracy. And we also need to continue to improve how we use it. Like I said, um, using the more accurate operator by modeling the observable, more accurate, it, it really does make an impact. Thank you very much. I uh, uh, appreciate uh, and your invitation to give this presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. I always enjoy these talks uh, a lot. Um, there have been a couple of questions that have come up. Uh, so there was a question about how many um, parameters are in a global numerical weather model. And I just said lots, so I'll just leave it at that. So a model at 20 kilometer horizontal resolution, 140 vertical uh, uh, levels and 10 or 20 uh, variables at every model is just a tremendous number of observations. It's, it's a huge inverse parameter. Um, so, um, Bill, so one thing came up about path data can, and using polarimetric RO for liquid water vapor or liquid water. Um, what has there been, do you know if there's been much progress on uh, implementing uh, path uh, polarimetric observations? Not, not at all. And I think this is one promising area where we certainly can benefit from that. Um, the, the short answer is no, but I think something is really promising. We should really look at that. Yep. I agreed. And so I, for people who don't know, there is a satellite mission called PATH that uses polarimetric radio occultation, horizontal and vertical, and they uh, use that and to basically derive uh, some amount of how much water is on the profile, how much liquid water is on the profile that would be complementary to a water vapor profile. Are there any other questions? Uh, Myra, I'm answering your um, your question about IGS products. So the Cosmic program uses a number of IGS products, um, mostly uh, GNSS transmitter clocks, um, uh, clocks in orbits, I'm sorry. And then also we use uh, differential code biases and we use uh, data from the ground sites, from IGS ground stations um, through their streaming. Um, also, so I um, have to see, Cosmic. Do, do, do. I hope that answers that. Cosmic is equipped with a GLONASS receiver. Yes. Is GLONASS is used for RO? Yes, GLONASS is used for RO. And so from just a number of satellites point of view, uh, it is used for both RO and PW, POD. Um, the number of RO observations from GLONASS is about 40% of the observations per day. And that's kind of just the number of tra GLONASS transmitters versus GPS transmitters. Um, thanks, Jim. Uh, any other questions here? Um, okay. There is another session that's going to start in about a minute here. So uh, I'll just wait one more second and I'll, I can stick around yeah, here. Uh, I wanted okay. to come in that, uh, yeah, indeed, uh, the global model has um, a lot of parameters. And I want to make a point about how important the radio quotation is, is that uh, actually uh, one of the, the, the product that, uh, that is very important for climate analysis is we, something we call it the, the uh, reanalysis. Basically the global models would, re, would reprocess the data and try to assimilate all the observation using the latest uh, model and data simulation systems. 
it's interesting, many global centers, they are trying to do the reanalysis and they find that when they don't use the radio quotation data, they there's a discrepancy among the reanalysis. And the reason is because the microwave and infrared, they don't have enough uh, vertical resolution to tie it down. And when you started to use the radio quotation data, they are kind of coming together. And this again, point out the importance of radio quotation in being a much more precise observations uh, for, for the uh, observation for, of the atmosphere. Again, thank you. Thank you uh, for the IGS community and uh, appreciate all the product and services that you provide uh, to us. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Okay, I think that concludes this session. Thanks, Bill. Great Thank talk. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye.